it's very cold. Okay, so we have this nozzle. We have air, it's going in through this nozzle at 25 meters per second, and then it's leaving the nozzle at a velocity that we're not sure. But we know it's entering with this set of properties here, and we know it's leaving with this set of properties here. Okay, and then the idea of these nozzles is note that the state of energy of the second state, so this state two, is lower in energy than the first one. Okay, so what we're doing is the opposite of what we've been doing uh, so far. So we have state one on a higher energy level, and then we go down to state two on a lower energy level. Okay, that's what the, the air inside that nozzle is doing. And then we're taking advantage of this decrease in energy state, right? This delta u that's decreasing. And we're using this energy to boost our kinetic energy for the air. Okay, that's the idea of these nozzles. Now, how do we account for that? Well, for any moving fluid, whenever we have a moving fluid, okay, let's put it down here, moving fluid. The energy, let's just write it, write it down. The energy, forms of energy that this moving fluid is going to have are the following. We're going to have what we call the pressure volume energy or the flow energy, right? Which is the same idea from the one that we've been talking so far. As this fluid is changing the pressure and the change in volume that it does, it's going to have the internal energy that you guys know very well already. It's going to have the kinetic energy. It's going to have the potential energy. Okay, now we're going to eliminate this guy as we go for almost, uh, let me rephrase that. I don't know of any case that in which you cannot disconsider the potential energy because for us to be, to have to consider, we're going to have to have a nozzle that's big enough in which the distance of this molecule to the ground is way bigger than the distance of this molecule to the ground. That I never seen a nozzle that it's that big. Okay, so we don't need to worry about potential energy. Let's get, we'll get we're going to get rid of it. Okay, so that's those are the energy forms that we have. What else are we going to do? We're going to use our mass conservation principle, which states that the flow of mass on one has to be equal to the flow of mass on two. And last but not least, we're going to use our energy conservation principle. Yeah, that states that the change in energy has to be zero, or in other words, there can't be, can't create or destroy any energy, right? Oops, sorry. So we're gonna use these concepts to solve this question. These are our basic concepts, okay? So let's look at this, uh, let's put this all together. So if the change in energy has to be the same, that means that, in other words, that means that energy on state one has to be equal to the energy in state two if we sum up all the energies with the sum of energies to make it more consistent sum of energy has to be the same okay what is this so let's put all the things that we have so we have pressure one volume one with vol so we don't get confused with the, with the velocity internal energy one kinetic energy one potential energy one on this side here Potential energy two, volume two, internal energy two, kinetic energy two, potential energy two. Okay, so we say that P potential energy one is equal to potential energy two so that we can eliminate them both from the equation, right? So we can say that as long as, as I said, it's not a, a huge nozzle, that is true. And then we're going to kill this and make this equation a bit smaller, right? We're going to have P2 volume 2 plus, oops, sorry, 1, 1, 1, 1, kinetic energy 1 equals P2 volume 2, internal energy 2, kinetic energy 2. All right. Now, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send um, this guy here. I'll send it subtracting over there okay so actually before i do that before i do that who was paying attention last week please tell me what this is equal to this guy here pressure so volume what's that Come again? Uh, you need to move the page up a little bit sorry is it better 
Entropy. Yep. Apologies. So pressure times volume plus internal energy, that's equal to what? Entropy. Entropy. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention. All right. So by the definition of entropy, we can change these guys into entropy. All right. So I'm going to rewrite the whole thing on the top. Or over here on the corner. So let's rewrite this same equation. It's going to come over here. So what do we have? We have enthalpy one plus kinetic energy one equals enthalpy two plus kinetic energy two. Brilliant. All right. So as long as we have the values for enthalpy for both and the kinetic energy of one, we can find the kinetic energy of the other one. With this kinetic energy, we can find the velocity, right? So go ahead and break this further down, okay? I'm gonna break my big H, so the enthalpy in energy, I'm gonna break into small h times mass, right? It's exactly the same thing, right? It's exactly the same thing, okay? And this guy I'm gonna break into velocity squared times mass, velocity one squared. This guy, same thing, mass, small h two, this guy, same thing, mass, velocity two squared over two. Okay, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna smartly take the derivative of all this, or let's just put, yeah, the energy with respect to time. If you guys remember, that's power, okay? And I'll show you why I'm doing that in one second. Um, derivative of H1 in respect to time does not change, right? The enthalpy for this gives, given set of properties does not change with time. So therefore it comes out of my derivative and it's just gonna be how mass changes with time. On this guy here, my velocity one does not change with time. The velocity that goes in, it's always 25 meters per second. So it's not change of time. It can come out of the derivative. So it's gonna be V1 squared and then the derivative of mass change of time. And the same thing is gonna to apply to the other ones, right? So it's gonna be H2 dm2 dt and v2 squared dm2 dt. Okay, now smartly, what have I done? I have converted this into mass flow rate instead of just having mass, okay? And I'm gonna apply this principle here that if the mass flow rate on the first states have to be equal to the second states, I can eliminate all of this, okay? So I can divide, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide this whole equation by the mass flow rate. Divide all the terms on this equation by the mass flow rate. So I'm gonna have, uh, which by the way, it's the same thing as the MDT, right? Just in case somebody who doesn't know that. Okay, so this is gonna render H1 plus V1 squared equals H2 plus V2 squared. And I'm missing the over two here. Two over two. Yeah, are we good so far? Uh, thank you, yeah, I put it over two over there. Thank you, I almost forgot about it. Okay, so next step, we are off to this guy here. So I'm gonna send this one subtracting. It's gonna be H1 minus H2, and I'm gonna multiply everything by two. So V2 squared will be my V1 squared plus two times my H1 minus H2. Pablo, will I need to derive this if I'm solving it? Yes, you will, because the way that you plug in these numbers is going to change according to the situation. You may have, for instance, which is the next case, for instance, you may have some heat being lost over here. So you're gonna have to account for that when you're plugging in these numbers. That's gonna change the way this ends up being solved, okay? So watch out for that. The next thing to watch out for is the following. Check out this part here, this line of work here. Okay, if we're summing up two things, they have to be the same unit, right? They have to be the same unit, okay? And if we're taking the kinetic energy to be mass velocity over two, what's the unit of this guy? It has to be joules, right? Remember that joules is, remember that um, mass velocity squared, what is that in, in, in units? It's kilogram meters squared, second squared. Meters squared, we can break down in meters times meters. So this is gonna be meters over second squared, acceleration times mass, Newton's second law, Newton's. Newton's times meters, that's joule. 
So mv squared is a joule. Okay? So for this to be valid, everything here has to be in joules. Everything has to be in joules. If I have something that is in kilojoules, which is very likely since our table gives us in kilojoules, we cannot sum them up. So everything has to be converted to joules. Okay, so if you want this guy to be in meters per second, we need to make sure that our, um, our unit here is joules per kilogram. Why is it per kilogram? Because they divided by the mass flow rate, remember? So since I'm dividing by the mass flow rate, I'm eliminating the mass on all the terms that I have there. Uh, Pablo? Yeah. Uh, can't we take uh, this M in the second second line, just in just like uh, factorize and just take this out, rather than taking this power into consideration and putting this derivative. Uh, yes and no. Yes, because uh, for this example, yes, that can be yeah. done. But you'll see that the next one, for instance, we have power coming out, so we have energy loss. It's not energy; it's a power loss. Okay. Okay. So definitely watch out because if you can do this step, it's, it's optional in this case. You could have done it, like you said, no problems at all. At all. But for the next one, you're gonna have to do this one step here, okay? And okay. the other thing is, mind you that this is always gonna be similar, right? So I know the first time is like, mind blown, but it's always similar work, okay? But now, after we did all this hard work, after you guys made through this, all this hard work, we're left with this simple equation here, right? The velocity two equals the velocity one, plus two times h1 minus h2. We have this guy already. We don't know these two guys. So just need to grab these two guys and we can solve this problem. So let's do that. Uh, Pablo, do you reckon the recording will line up? Or... So I don't, I don't know, Jason. I'm not sure because last week it was of poor quality. So I'm checking this week if it's uh, understandable and the quality of the video is okay, I might upload it. But definitely I'm putting the next question up online for you guys. Okay, I'm making a video of the next one for you 100%. Okay, so what are we after now? We just need to find H1 minus H2. That's all we need, okay? As simple as that. We have two options. We can use CP or we can use a table. Okay, I'll show you guys both. Um, we'll solve it all with the table and then I'll just show you how to use CP if you want to, okay? So from the table, what are we gonna do? Well, we need to go to the air table. And we need to grab the values for entropy, right? So let's do that. I'll open up my property tables here. Hopefully it's going to be there you go. Yeah. And I'm going to go to air table. And my air table is all the way on page 924. Okay. So this is air. And this is approximated as an ideal gas and we can grab entropy for it, okay? We want, what's the temperature that we want? We want uh, at 643 Kelvin for the first state and 613 for the second one. So 643 will be between these two guys here. So it's gonna be a value between these two guys here. We're gonna interpolate. And for the second one, it's gonna be between these two guys here. Okay, so a little interpolation for us. Plug it in, let's plug it in. Okay, so from the table, what do we get? All right, so from table, let's go here, A17. Temperature, enthalpy, uh, 640, 650 Kelvin. And we're after the 643, which is our inlet. And then this guy is 649.22. Kilojoules per kilogram. This guy is 659.84 kilojoules per kilogram. And uh, we can spit out the interpolation here. I got 652.4. Yep. And for the outlet, for the outlet, we have the following situation, temperature, topi. temperature 610, 620, and our temperature of 613. Okay, this is 
1.53. This is 628.07, I think. And then the interpolation of this spits out 620.7 kilojoules per kilogram. All right, so as easy as that, now we can find the delta between the two. One thing, actually two things to watch out for, okay? Because once we get here, we're comfortable. You guys have been doing this for a while. There's two things to watch out for. The first one is that our equation is H1 minus H2, right? So far we've been dealing with the end state minus the initial, but you saw the way we did write the equation, so now it's H1 minus H2. So it's gonna be this guy minus this guy, right? Instead of the opposite. Uh, the other thing is, Units, right? I just talked about that. So we want it in joules per kilogram and we have kilojoules per kilogram. So let's make sure we convert before we plug into our equation, okay? So going back to our V2, which is V1 squared plus two H1 minus H2. Our V2 squared will be, uh, what was uh, 25 meters per second? Plus two times, Difference here is 652.4 minus 620.7. And don't forget, this is 10 to the third, right? Because we wanted joules per kilogram. So all this guy is going to be in joules per kilogram. Okay? Uh, this guy as well. Okay? Don't forget that. This guy as well. Because this is going to be meters squared over seconds squared, which is equivalent of having um, joules per kilogram. Okay? You can work that out like we did before. Okay, and then my V2 will be the square of 625 plus, what do I have over here on this side? Two times 31.7 times 10 to the third. So my V2 will be 253 meters per second. Okay, so that's one way to do it. That's one way to solve it, to using, using the tables. Let me know if you guys have any questions at this point. Yeah, just, if, yeah, go for it. Just one question. Wasn't the temperatures like 340 and 370? Uh, 370 Celsius, right? Oh, uh, there we then go. That's in Kelvin, check it out. I'll yeah, show you, yeah, check yeah. out the table. I know check what I've table. done. There you go. Temperature in the table is given in Kelvin. That's why I converted it. Yeah, my bad. No worries. Good call. Anyways, good to ask. Make sure we have the right temperatures. <laughs> okay. So that's one way to do it. And it's a way that you guys are very comfortable because you guys are very used to grabbing the values off the tables. And hopefully that's something that's easy for you already and all that. But if you want to, if you want to, you're welcome to use CP. Why? Because CP is defined as the way that my enthalpy varies with temperature, okay? And then if I get an average, just like we did the same thing for uh, delta U, we can do this delta H will be CP uh, delta T. And this is times mass because it's a big one. And if I want a small one, it's a CP delta T without the mass, okay? So we can do, it's the same exact principle of the delta U we did before of the CV, we can do this instead, okay? So if you want to do that, what you do is instead of going and grabbing these values like we did, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find a value for CP. And to do that, we're gonna to go to table A2, the one we were looking at before, page 900. And we're gonna see that our CP will vary between 600 and 650 and we want it to be on the average, on the bulk temperature, right? Just like we did on the previous exercise. So our two temperatures, 613 and 643. So our average between the two will be six, where is my average? 628, Kelvin. Okay, and then we're gonna go on that table and we're gonna grab the values for CP for <clears throat> 600 and then 650, and then we're gonna interpolate for 628, right? 
this is 1.051 this is 1.063 and this guy gets spit out in the interpolation as 1.158 reduce kilograms Got it. okay so another way to do this i'll be trivial for you guys at this point my delta h will be 1.058 times my temperature indifference. And then in this case, if I just do delta T like that we're used to, we're gonna have a negative, negative value. And that's fine because it's saying that we're going to a lower state of energy. That's the way it should be, All right? So it's um, six, four, three minus six, 13. But either way, don't forget that the negative sign, only thing it's telling you it's the direction of the energy, whether it's being lost or gained. All right, so my Delta H will be 31.7 kilojoules per kilogram. Which if you notice is exactly this value here. Right, exactly that Delta H that we had there. This guy here. Okay, so if you do the normal way, this will be gonna be negative. It's gonna be the 613 minus 643, that's fine. But if you want to plug it in, you're going to have to invert it because this is going to be H1 minus H2, not H2 minus H1. Okay, so it's going to be a positive value there. So either way, table, if you're more comfortable with the table, use CP if you're more comfortable with CP. Either way is fine, but that's how you solve it. All right. Now, the next question, the last one of this week, obviously there's no time for it, but that's okay because that's what happened with the other classes. So I have already recorded it and uploaded it should be online in the next 10 minutes. I just need to make sure it's all there. There's nothing missing. And then make sure you watch that and solve that for, your, for yourselves. Okay? Uh, guys, if you don't have any other questions,